back again to the in the third chapter once more. And we'll continue the theme which we've which we, which we been studying over the past several days. And uh, we finish with verses 1 to 7. Let's read now verses 8 down to verse 13, 8 through 13, please. To me, to
So when we find find that husband, then we have not seen God as we ought to have seen him, obviously. And uh, we fall within say, I am blessed and the least of all saints, when such a revelation of God's goodness and beauty is given to us. And of course, as we've been reading yesterday night, Paul saw the mystery of God as it had not been seen by him and before him, and became the greatest expander of this theme of all the people of his time. So Paul therefore felt unworthy to be given this gift, and uh, truly he was, and we are too. He says, to me, this grace was given. To me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the general of the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, God needs men and women of confidence, of faith, but not confidence in himself, but in him, of course. And uh, when God calls a true messenger, when God himself calls the messenger, what is the message, the prospective message, messenger's usual reaction to that call? Does he jump at it? No. No, no what, what's the usual reaction? He tries everything in his power to get away. That's right. One of the best examples, of course, is Moses, who really argued against God in this case, and uh, God seemed to become impatient with him. In the end, of course, God does not become impatient. He seemed to become impatient with Moses and put him in straight, straight, strong terms. He was the man called of God to go do the work, and he finally uh, went. Now, once Moses did decide to accept the call from them, then on what happened? There was no further question. He took the work then very seriously and very faithful to the end of his life. Uh, who else would you name that was very reluctant to take up the work God called him to give? Jeremiah. Jeremiah, very good. <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 1. Uh, Jeremiah said, Who am I to go and speak these words to the, uh, to the uh, unrepentant and apostate <coughs> Jews? Anybody else? No white. No white. Yeah, anybody else? Right. <laughs> <laughs> He's out of the question. <laughs> William Miller? Right. Now, John the Baptist didn't seem to be in this category, and Christ himself uh, likewise moved with a sure step from one point to the next in his mission. At what time did Christ begin to understand the nature of his mission? At the first, at his first pass, at the age of 12 years of age. Then the mystery of his mission again to the following point. He saw himself as the actual Lamb of God and said in his heart, I will do it. And at his baptism, he poured out that dedicatory prayer, and then the voice of God said, This is my son. And Christ said again, I will do it. So we find Christ uh, moving out with sure steps from point to point in his experience and accepting each responsibility as it came. And I guess that every member of God's church should be in the same, in the same uh, category. But certainly to feel unworthy is not better than feeling worthy because you never will be really worthy of your position as a servant of God, will you? Now, this was done that he might preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you like those two words, unsearchable riches? Yes. I certainly do. Now, so far as the world is concerned, where are riches to be found? As far as the world is concerned? The world be world. Where do they look for riches? Financial success under the earth. Right, financial success, political power, numbers power, people power, all that kind of thing is what men see as being the source of their riches. But, uh, and, they, and they see rather that the <coughs> church goes up, is a place for poverty and want and sacrifice and so on. Now, the end of history, in what category of God's folk is usually found? Whoever. Right? materially poverty stricken. Was this God's intention? Never. Never. I tend to desire of ages to just remind you of this in the chapter called The Chosen People, which is earlier in the book, and uh, there is made plain in explaining the great Old Testament scriptures that God in, God planned to be spoken to the people, the head and not the tail, the first and not the last, the intellectual giants of the day. But unfortunately they to their apostasy, failed to reap that glorious um, uh, achievement. That's my statement there. 
chapter for the chosen people. Where is that chapter? Right. That's uh, page 28, I believe. Right. Good, page 28, the first two paragraphs, please. But the Israelites fixed their hopes upon worldly greatness. In the time of their entrance to the land of Canaan, they departed from the commandments of God and followed the ways of the heathen. It was in vain that God sent them warning by his prophets. In vain they suffered the chastisement of heathen oppression. Every reformation was followed by deeper apostasy. Had Israel been true to God, he could have accomplished his purpose through their honor and exaltation. If they had walked in the ways of obedience, he would have made them high above all nations which he has made in praise and in name and in honor. All people of the earth, said Moses, shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. The nations which shall hear all these statutes shall say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. But because of their under uh, but because of their unfaithfulness, God's purpose could be wrought out only through continued adversity and humiliation. Yeah, that, that was a tragedy, wasn't it? <clears throat> God placed Israel in the most strategic place upon the face of the earth for the purpose of uh, communicating his grace. Israel was a land situated on the crossroads on the trade route from the north to the south. From uh, Rome and Greece and uh, Asia down to, to the great cities of Africa and Egypt and so on, the caravans travel and therefore is Israel is located at the best possible mission centre in the world. And God plan should be the world missionary centre, a place where men would come, see the wonders of Jewish prosperity in physical, mental, intellectual and spiritual greatness and be led to lay hold upon the truth of God. But Solomon recognized that it also was a perfect trade center for the world, a place of making money, a place of getting extremely rich, and uh, if you're all about the gospel center, center made it to be a trade center with the result of Israel became extremely rich for a short time, but then came corruption, greed, avarice, strife, contention, competition, idolatry, and so forth. And uh, Israel lost her wealth, became a poverty-stricken nation, and as such, of course, uh, was no longer the witness she might have been and would have been to the people of that time. And then God would have to, had to work through her uh, adversity and poverty to effect his mighty cause and his mighty truth. Now, we are blessed, of course, with, with witnesses to what might have been. And so far as the Jewish folk are concerned, who would you say in Old Testament times, gave the finest uh, revelation of what might have been in the land of Israel. You may think it's something different from me, but who do you think of? Well, I would say Samuel, or, uh, well, David, actually. Yes, David, yeah, David's a good example. I was thinking of Daniel again. And now, Daniel and Jesus Christ and Moses and Paul were men of tremendous intellectual achievement, right? Tremendous. In fact, we find that Daniel was ten times better than the wisest men who could be found in the land of Babylon, which was a great blow to the, Babyl the Babylonians. Now, today, we, we find the leading scientists and economists and philosophers and, and um, uh, so on today. <laughs> I wasn't planning to be particularly nationalistic in this case. <laughs> Babylon amongst, amongst the worldly people. And you generally find that God spoke uh, because of being unlettered and unlearned so far as the world's great sciences are concerned. But uh, who should be the world's greatest thinkers, the world's greatest discoverers, and vendors of the present time? God's true people. Um, I think we can find a state of education now where Sitoi talks about the intellectual achievements of Jesus Christ. I have, I have included a statement in the book Child Salvation, I know. Um, just to find it here quickly. Which 
is why it tells us that Jesus could have uh, unlocked the secrets of nature and science and kept mind busy for the rest of time. But he didn't do this because he came to fulfill a more important mission. And when we think that the Bible was his only textbook, it was the Old Testament back in those days, of course, and the Holy Spirit is only teacher, it's, it's an amazing uh, tribute. I've got this one to you right now, but it's in the chapter chapter on Jesus Christ and the book Education. I marvel that Jesus Christ, with the book of nature before him, and the Old Testament at his disposal, and God as his teacher, could discover science to such an extent that, that uh, you've, you've taken them beyond what they even know today. That's a fantastic uh, witness to the power of God's education when carried out properly and truly. Now, at the present time, what is the general status of God's true people in the world? Rich? Not too poor either. Really? Are we poverty stricken? No. no we're rich quite well in many respects. And uh, we all we need to have. We have food every day and clothing and a house over our heads and a car to drive in and good health too for that matter. But intellectually, we, what, what recognition do we have by the world? None. Okay. But Daniel is a picture. And by the way, was Daniel, was Daniel materially poor? No. No, he's a very rich man because he was way up there with the king and enjoyed the riches of Babylon. A very wealthy man indeed. Now, as we do that at the end of time, remember that Daniel is a type of the people of the last days, is he not? Yes. Right? Very much. We have the Daniel people. And we are soon to be committed to battle as he was against the very king of Babylon himself, and we shall triumph as he triumphed back there. Therefore, his uh, intellectual might is a picture what we must attain to, as well as our material and physical well-being as well. So that uh, God will at last fulfill his purpose to that people who are what they should be in every single respect, physically, mentally, spiritually, and materially. I'm not saying all the millionaires don't get that idea. Uh, what was that, Tom? Just a few thousand would be. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you know, measure, measure your wealth, of course, by by financial power. And time will come and be no good anyway when, when the blind sort of creed comes in. Comes in. Now, so Paul came to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, the unsearchable does he mean that they are locked up completely, or, or what does he mean? Yeah, it says we'll never find the bottom of it. The depth, yeah. That's right. We're going to learn much and learn more and more, but never find the actual depth to the wonders of the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Which riches, of course, are the qualities of love and joy and peace and gentleness and mercy and thanksgiving and righteousness. Those are, those are the true riches which uh, Christ offers to us. The things of real worth and real value. Next verse now we'll take, which is verse uh, 9. So I'd like to read it to me, please. To make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Now as I read this, this verse, one word strikes my attention. What word strikes yours? And to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which we begin has been hidden and so on. Mystery. Mystery? Yeah, knowledge. Hidden. Yeah. Fellowship. Well, different people see the verse in different light, don't we? To me the word fellowship is the is the word which commands my attention. Make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery. What is fellowship? Harmony of harmony of Belief and love. Yes, that, that's the basic to it, but that's not fellowship. Communing together. That's right, communing together is fellowship. Doing things together, working together, loving together, achieving together. <coughs> All those things, of course, are fellowship. It's, it's actually moving along together and sharing life with each other. That's fellowship. It's the difference between that and the opposite, of course, of being lonesome, rejected, abandoned, solitary, which, of course, none of us care to be. Now, there's a fellowship in this mystery that uh, passes all human understanding. God is a very social creature, and he loves to dwell with his people and to fellowship with them. 
and longs to draw us to the closest possible relationship to him. Now, this this fellowship is possible because of the actual structure of the mystery. Here is God the Father, the source of all light and power, and he flows it flows to us and into us and through us through the ministry of Jesus Christ, the great connector. <coughs> The very, the very structure of the, of, the, of the mystery is to bring us into the closest possible fellowship with Christ and with the Father. That's the very structure of the mystery. Now, obviously, of course, the better we understand the structure of the mystery and the better we experience the mystery itself, the more we shall experience the fellowship which we spoke about in this particular verse. Now, fellowship with... Uh, People upon this earth on a friendly and neighborly basis is nice. On a family basis is, is better as done. In the church is better still. But best of all is the fellowship of Christ Himself or God through Jesus Christ. That's the best of all. And the sheer joy and happiness to be experienced in that kind of fellowship is yet to be experienced by God's good people. The joy is another with Margaret. Right, so Paul then desired to make all people see for themselves what is the fellowship of this mystery. So as he preached from day to day, he strove to open their understanding before they could see for themselves just what was involved in this glorious experience and the weight of them, make them hunger and thirst after the experience and desire all their hearts and all their souls. Now let's think of some of the qualities of this fellowship that do, or some of the qualities which make this fellowship real beyond, um, uh, beyond the inflow of life from God. I think, first of all, of mutual trust. Now, in the fellowship of that mystery, will, will there be mutual trust between every member of the family of God? Absolute trust, right? No, no need to, to be careful anymore about uh, what you say and what you do, unless you offend someone because of the continual open trust between every single person. And where there's perfect trust, there is perfect security and peace and perfect happiness, isn't there? And freedom. And freedom, right? Very good. Any other qualities that you can see that, that would be present in that kind of uh, fellowship? That would be love, good, and that of course again brings back perfect, 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 perfect trust. Because you can't ever trust the person that you love and who loves you, can you? There's one person you can really trust. Think about who you trust most in this world. The person that you love the best and who loves you the best. Any other qualities? With perfect security. And protection. How about acceptance one with another? Right, that's, that's, that's a good point. Because to be accepted, of course, is a very vital need of a human being, is it, is it not? <coughs> good. What about perfect health? Yes, Linda? I was just saying, going to say, always putting the best possible construction, uh, construction on the motives of someone, <coughs> whatever they do, and not seeing the negative. Sure. That's perfect, except the perfect trust. Mm -hmm. Now, just as Paul was generous to make people see what was the most of the so it's our duty as well to do the same. And uh, for what means shall we approach our responsibility of making all men see what is the fellowship of this mystery? What, what's our approach? First step? Help yourself. Exactly right. Experience it yourself. Second step? Study it, cultivate it, nurture it, increase it until it becomes a shining or outshining glory from your life experience. And pray God to give you the power to preach the truth of this mystery so people understand what that truth actually is. I think we'll learn more of the power of this mystery as time goes by and we'll preach it much more effectively than we personally do. Now Paul repeats the thought again, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. That repeats, of course, the thought that we addressed earlier that uh, there's been a progressive unfolding of this wonderful truth as time has gone by until it falls out that it was better known than it had been known previously. 
to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose you put the promise to Christ in our Lord. This is quite an amazing scripture because uh, who now becomes the teachers of who? As verse 10 plainly points out. We're, we're teaching the unlooking universe. Absolutely right. This is a reversal of the original situation because back in the Garden of Eden, who taught who? The angels taught Adam and Eve. Right, the angels taught Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden. But in the meantime, man slipped into sin and has experienced the salvation of God, which of course is the mystery of God in him, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And man, by virtue of his experience in the way of salvation, by his actual participation on the mystery of God in himself, has something which the angels don't have, but into which they desire to look, so they come to learn from the church the wonders of this glorious mystery, the principles and powers in heavenly places. Become the students, and the previous students become the teachers. What I what a remarkable reversal that is. Now, let me ask you again, just for interest sake, in verse 10, what word or two words particularly strike your attention? Verse 10. To the intent of now, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principles and powers in heavenly places. Any of your words that have cast your attention? The manifold wisdom of God, right? The manifold wisdom of God. We were talking yesterday about uh, love, love being accompanied by wisdom to keep it acting properly and not dangerously. Now, here we find that uh, the mystery God is described as the manifold wisdom of God. Now, this, this may list to what else it is. It is the, it's the wisdom of God is also the power of God. It's the salvation of God. It's the righteousness of God. It's the very life of God. And it's also the manifold wisdom of God. Now, we're told in the Spirit of Prophecy that none but God could have conceived the plan of salvation. Right? None but God could have conceived it. There's no man upon the earth that could have thought up the way out of the crisis back in the Garden of Eden. Did Adam, did Adam uh, work it out? Did Satan work it out? No. No way. It was worked out by whom alone? Okay. Right? Only by God and no, none else but him. And it comes to us for revelation. So therefore we require the love of God to do it and the manifold wisdom of God likewise to do it. Both love and wisdom have to play their part in forming the great plan of salvation. And it's quite a difficult thing to achieve because what God could not afford to do is to set the law aside in any sense of the word whatsoever. And the law had to be vindicated and had to stand. It had to require and get its demand, which was of course the uh, what's the word again, the, uh, the life of the sinner. Mm. It was a great controversy, page 4 18, I believe. Also they can play judge brothers as well. So how to give the law its just desserts and at the same time save the sinner was the great task which faced God up there in heaven. And it was no easy task to do that. Then why do you suppose force in the manifold wisdom of God, we could just say the wisdom of God. Why manifold wisdom? That's right, multiply. Multiply, yeah. multiply wisdom of God, the many facets of the wisdom, the many faced wisdom of God, many aspects. Why many, why why would Paul just say that the wisdom of God would have not been enough? <laughs>
that are depths to which need a, a good deal of understanding and explanation if we can grasp them. And so sin became a complex, multi-faced problem which had to be met in the same way. And God had to exercise his wisdom in each fear of the problem, perhaps in something of a different way, slightly different way than, than the others. So it became a manifold wisdom of God being a manifold problem of sin. Right? So then um, Paul talks not just of wisdom, but of manifold wisdom in his application of the wisdom of God to the problem which uh, faces mankind. Well, we're in verse 11, have there? Yes, right. And once again, to the principalities and powers of heavenly places, in the structure of God's government are there angels who lead out, angels who take command, or... Um, Or, or are they all uh, communists that set up women where it's supposedly equal? There's definitely order and qualifications for positions. Right. And each angel, of course, is given the position which he is qualified and which is fitted just to stand in the temple, occupy his rightful place in that temple structure. <coughs> now, verse 11. I'll to read this, please, somebody. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We mentioned this verse yesterday in passing and uh, noted the course that an eternal purpose has no beginning and no end. So even before angels were formed, Jesus Christ had uh, settled it, was appointed to the purpose of uh, being the channel of communication between God and all of his creatures throughout the entire universe when they should be brought into existence. Because whereas God himself has no beginning, obviously, of course, his creative works do have a beginning somewhere along the line. It's a long way back, though, so far, but it is, as it were, eternally anyway. So long before the media arose, the provision was made, and Christ was eternally purposed by God to fill that, that, that need. He did, he did, of course, in the time actually came. So I can certainly appreciate that fact that God was never caught by surprise. But those from the beginning just what to do in the case of, uh, of uh, problems which may arise. Now verse 12, was it written please? In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Now this is a very wonderful scripture. We have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. What would strike you in this verse? It must strike you in this verse. Boldness and confidence. And access with confidence, right? Now that, that, that's a wonderful scripture to say the least of it. What's that one in Hebrews the four chapter? Let us come boldly to the throne of grace, right? Now we have to realize that God has set up a line of communication between earth and heaven. And Jesus Christ, of course, is a key figure in that line of communication. And every petition which. Uh, is received by Jesus Christ, is passed on by him to the Father, and is heard by the Father with absolute certainty and, 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 and surety. What role does the Holy Spirit play in our prayers? In terms of when he also inspires them. And in Christ, I'll be listening to the last year that uh, we can no more pray without the ministry of the Holy Spirit can come out the ministry of Christ. And that's basically in a chapter entitled uh, Asking to Give. It's really in the book somewhere, I think. Uh, and just what makes it plain there that uh, we can no more pray without the ministry of the Spirit than we can without the ministry of Christ in the most holy place. And therefore, we need the Holy Spirit to inspire our prayers, to put words in our mouth to give those words power as they go up to the Almighty. Right, here's the chapter now. Right, page 147. We must not only pray in Christ's name, but by the inspiration of the Spirit. It doesn't say it all, but that's one statement in that direction. Page 147. No, Christ will be good. We must not only pray in Christ's name, but by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Right, so that uh, our first task is to claim the ministry.
through the Holy Spirit and inspire our words in the land of Jesus Christ. And then in turn, <laughs> Jesus Christ takes those prayers and presents them before the Father, which has come with, with great boldness to the throne of grace to claim the riches and blessings that God has thus made available to us from his bountiful strife in heaven. Now, if we what what will give boldness to our prayers? Well, that's the same thing, isn't it? <coughs> Confidence is boldness. Knowledge Knowledge and experience. Yeah. When, when do we feel least bold in coming to Christ? When we're guilty of sin. Right, when we're guilty of sin. Especially if we've uh, gained victory over certain sin and then we lapse back into it again. If uh, our promises are like ropes of sin, we've broken that promise before God. If we repeat the same sin, Perhaps over and over again, we become very reluctant then to come to God. And we even say, well, I'll leave this till the morning until I feel better. (laughs) Have the experience. And um, back in the Garden of Eden, of course, Adam and Eve were quite bold in their walk with Jesus Christ until they ate of the fruit of the tree and they hid themselves from his presence. And likewise, we tend to do the same thing, but we need need to be boldest of all. And we have fallen into sin, don't we? God will forgive 70 times 7, or at least He will forgive always. His mercy endures forever. On the other hand, of course, we must not uh, turn this provision into a sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess program, which is pure Roman Catholicism or Babylonism uh, at its very best. There should be true penitence, even if you <laughs> fail and fail again. There must be true, true penance and a, and, a, and a holy, bold determination not to be caught for the same trap once more. Can certainly gain the victory, of course, if we really set out our hearts to do so. But um, we need to realise, of course, that those who ask receive, and those who not have the door open to them, whereas those who fail to ask find themselves left destitute of the heavenly graces. And in this time of latter rain, we have to pray for rain now in the time of the latter rain, are we not? Don't wait for the fall by nature, we must pray for it. So let, let, the spirit, let the spirit of prayer really possess us in our prayer season each morning and evening. Let's really join heartily in searching or seeking and asking for these great blessings boldly because we have access with confidence to the grace that God gives, gives to us. I've got to put my time on. I'm not sure what time we have left. How much of the papers there left? Uh, three to five minutes. Very good. Okay, good. My time this morning. So we have access with confidence to Him through faith in Him. The stronger your faith, the stronger the access which you have unto God. And I do find that uh, the deeper in my troubles, the more boldly and strongly I come before God, the more effectively I get answers to those prayers. Now, verse 13, please. Therefore, I desire that you faint not as my Thank you very much. <laughs> now, Paul says, I ask that you do not lose faith or lose heart of my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Now, in what way would Paul's tribulations cause him to lose heart? Well, they weren't doing it. Paul was doing the thing, wasn't he? I think it's saying, gee, if uh, the closer I get to developing the character of Christ, the harder it's going to be for For who? Themselves. Themselves? Yes, but uh, I still ask the question. In what way should Paul's tribulations cause him to lose heart? If he bore them bravely and bold and well, would they give them confidence? Yes, uh, Frederick. Perhaps in the same sense that the, uh, <coughs> the young uh, that fellow that came to Christ the healing of his son and thought he was a dusty, uh, careworn traveler, perhaps the fact that um, people see someone who's supposed to be so close to God and yet suffering so much, they might tend to think, well, you know, is God really with him or not? Uh-huh. You're on target. Yeah, because it's saying, don't faint at what's happening to me. Right. What about if he does, he's not seeing the end results? Uh, well, that's true. But Frank has made the point quite nice. Remember this: that uh, Isaiah 58, 53, 
through, I believe it is, says that, uh, well, let's turn to it, shall we, and read, read the scripture in regard to Jesus Christ. 53. Isaiah. There's that great chapter which talks about the sufferings of Jesus Christ and his being stricken and afflicted. Yes, let's read verses 1 to uh, 3, please. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of covering or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not receive him. Thank you very much. Now, <coughs> we didn't read the word stricken in the wings somewhere. Stricken. That's verse 4. Verse 4, that's right. Read it too, please. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Good, thank you very much. Now, just like poor Jesus Christ suffered some fearful afflictions and uh, sufferings and hardships and burdens during his life experience, so as they appeared stricken by the people to, or to the people because of them, they rejected him, didn't they? They expected to find a strong healthy, handsome man as their Prince Messiah to come amongst them, another beautiful David or, or a gorgeous Solomon or a mighty Saul and so forth. When Christ came stricken because of his hardships and sufferings, many folk turned their backs upon him. And in like manner, Paul was suffering, as I read those open page 147 sketches of the life of Paul, was suffering from a serious tax upon his resources because of his of his work. <coughs> read the statement again for you. Page 147 in Sketch in the Life of Paul. Uh, it talked about battling against opposition, untying, untying zeal, pushing forward the work of the gospel, and bearing upon his soul the burden of all the churches, nor was he released even from the tax of physical labor. In weariness and painfulness from unceasing toil and constant danger, and he were by disease and by the best and spiritually definitely pursuing his work. So the word tax comes through very strongly in that paragraph. He was taxed, which means he, he was paying a, a price or a penalty for his incessant labor. And <clears throat> he wasn't in people by disease, he was, he'd become a weak man because of sickness. Does that surprise you? He does me because um, I read about Christ replenishing his resources every single day. We do have the promise in regard to God's people that faith too can receive a fresh endowment of the physical, mental, and spiritual respect every single day. Let's turn to the Zion at the end of the chapter led by, uh, entitled, uh, you might know, Go Go Ye to All the World. We find that in that chapter we have uh, this great and glorious promise given to God's people, which is just as valid for Paul as it was for Jesus Christ, or for you and me at the present time. So there was no problem with God, there was no problem with Paul. Say it again. So there was no problem with God as far as what he wanted him to be, but there was a problem with Paul as far as him not being healthy. I'm not saying that. Uh, could be, but I'm not, I'm not saying that. Page 827. So I'm going to read the paragraph which begins with all who consecrate soul, body, and spirit to God. All who consecrate soul, body, and spirit to God will be constantly receiving a new endowment of physical and mental power. The inexhaustible supplies of heaven are at their command. Christ gives them the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. The Holy Spirit puts forth its highest energies to work in heart and mind. The grace of God enlarges and multiplies their faculties, and every perfection of the divine nature comes to their assistance in the work of saving souls. 
through cooperation with Christ, they are complete in Him, and in their human weakness, they are enabled to do the deeds of omnipotence. As well as our proximity. Very. And um, what do you expect your, your, your ministry to be like in the world that comes? Weak and uh, sick and so on? No. No, vibrant and powerful and uh, full of vigor and energy and strength and so forth. And that's what it appears to be. You don't expect to find a feeble person or a weak person or a sick person carrying out the word of God with that kind of promise before him. And yet we find that in Paul's case he was enfeebled by disease and taxed and uh, weary and, and, and tired. Like one, one statement says his careworn face uh, was there before the people. Now, it gives me the impression perhaps that, uh, that Paul might have been carrying some of the load himself. This is a problem I, I, you know, when you read through the experiences of God's workers, that they tend to have a problem, like James White, of <coughs> not totally resting in God, because the promises are sure, you see. Right. And so there's nothing wrong with the promise, and God is faithful. So if the person is fulfilling the condition, they should receive the result of what, what it says. I mean, these words are not empty words. So if we see a messenger of God, or, or any one of us, you know, not really experiencing this, well, we can't say that God doesn't want that. We have to say, well, somehow we're not, there's something wrong. We have to say, well, the only thing we can say, you know, that it's right. ourselves. Well, we'll leave it there and I'll pick up your thought and come back to the next study period because it's it just uh, gone. Any questions you'd like to ask or thought you'd like to add at this point before we try to complete it? Yes, uh, um, I have a question. Back on verse 12. Um, when you read the verse, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith in him, the King James says the faith of him. Now, is there not a critical difference between those two? Yeah. Well, I like both these questions, of course, because they both have a meaning. For the faith of Jesus is his faith, that is his actual faith, and they both right. have his victory. Right. Faith in him, of course, is resting in his power, giving us that victory. Mm -hmm. But doesn't it make a tremendous difference on how we use those phrases in the scriptures? I mean, that, that's been my personal pet peeve when it comes to looking at a new translation. And I never bought the New King James for that very reason. Because they changed faith in, of Christ to faith in Christ. And in Galatians, it makes a tremendous difference in a verse when they change that to faith in. And I think, you know, in this particular, we can miss the beauty of that verse if we take it and think it's my faith that makes that boldness and access. It's Christ's faith that opened the door, and it's only his faith, by his faith, that I can even enter in. It has nothing to do with my faith. My faith in him only enables him to give me his faith that gets me through the door. I mean, you know, to me, there's a tremendous difference there. You're anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh... I think that's true. And in all the camp meetings that I've been to where Fred has talked about, you know, faith... Uh, in or of Christ is always really brought out. The faith of Christ is what's necessary for us to attain that level of perfection that's uh, necessary to give the demonstration. And I, I notice that is perhaps one of the shortcomings of this too. You know, it's good to, to know that King James and what it really says because there's little things like that in this too. I've found, found the faith of Christ is also different than faith in Christ. It's Many people in Babylonian churches have quote unquote faith in Christ, but it's it's not a saving faith, and it's the faith of Christ that is necessary to bring us to that level of qualification that we need. <coughs> the faith of Jesus is the faith which asks only two questions: What is God's promise? And what is His command? And that is the faith of one of trust the other. That is the faith of Jesus. This is what we must have. Absolutely, faith in Christ, of course, is trust that He will. Give us, give us a power to do that. Let's go to take a break, shall we? Uh, now, 49 already. Uh, let's come back and begin by flight to 11, 11 and 5. Oh, yeah. I've been flashed up in my mind. I don't want to have a new law sent out there. But the great discouragement she has the other people. This is a good one, but it only has the major words. The other one has the 
most famous one is the most bad. Do you know that by giving them the gospel in a sense you start with them? And they reject the truth. Yeah. And Christ had that many times when he had some time. You know, when he was talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And all of a sudden they left him and then he looked at the cross and thought what you were doing. Those were times of discouragement. When he wept over Israel, and they were rejected. That moves up in my head. 